Welcome back, folks. It's just about time to start. You know, school's starting up, which means college football's around the corner, and we bring in our college football man, well, at least one of them, uh, <laughs> James H. Williams, uh, Southern California News Group. He's all over the place. We go way back to when I was sending you highlights from yes. uh, Riverside Football for the Press Enterprise, and man, look what look where you are now, man. Uh, <laughs> just, a, just a kid from Downey, you know, and he's right. moving on up covering UCLA. Uh, you got We got his Twitter handle up there, but I want to also remind people that if you want the insight into the Bruins week to week, he's got the Believe Bruin podcast with Josh Woods. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll, I'll confess, part of the reason I'm having you on here is it's a bandwidth thing. I haven't been able to listen, but during the season last year, you guys were top priority because I was doing awesome. a lot of traveling, doing a lot of driving. Hey, let's see what James and Josh have to say. Uh, good to see you, my friend. You're looking great. Awesome. First of all, thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's 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 been going good. Uh, yeah, come a long way, especially since I, I met you back in the day and we first started communicating. Um, come a long way. Got a ways to go. Got a, an announcement uh, here that I'm kind of holding on to, I think, to the end of the week. I don't know when I'm supposed to announce my next move, but it's supposed to be <laughs> sometime here right. soon. Well, I mean, because um, you're the guy now. Like people, you know, people yeah, have you on yeah. and you, you have the insight, which is kind of why you're on here. Mm -hmm. um so let's start at the beginning new coach sure. who this so you were there last year with chip kelly mm -hmm. and now you're here with deshaun foster mm -hmm. um your observations from being in camp and i got to get out to practice at some point which i have not and that's my bad but um mm -hmm. what's the major differences or are there any that you see from last year to this year yeah okay yeah that, that's interesting yeah i mean just the five years I had with Chip Kelly just to this one year yeah, has been a breath of fresh air. It's the oh, flowers really? are, the, the flowers are, are blooming and every, no, um, it's, it's just different from the standpoint of, you know, even just from the media perspective of, of doing the, the press conferences in the morning before practice, there's no dread. There's no regret on either side of wanting to be there. Right. I think part of it is is Deshaun Foster. Um, it's his first year. It's his first kind of go around doing the the media stuff, especially in the coaching kind of uh, world. Because I, Chip Kelly, never let the assistants really do interviews except the last year or two during the spring. So there, we had probably only talked to Deshaun Foster once or twice. I would thankfully I had him on the podcast last year. Um, so he hadn't had a whole lot of reps and, and maybe that that kind of speaks for for what happened there with him at media day but it's just he's very kind of candid he doesn't hold anything back he doesn't you know and maybe over time as he kind of develops you know he'll he'll kind of know to, how to dodge questions or or not give too much away but right now if you ask him anything he'll tell you hey why is so and so out oh concussion uh you know yeah. ACL injury. He'll tell you stuff. Chip was like, uh, can't tell you student student school policy or whatever. Right, He'd right. made up something, but right. it's just stuff like that. But I mean, the guys are, are energized out there. Um, there's not a whole lot of turnover from that standpoint. So it's not like they're necessarily doing anything different in that regard. The practice structures are a little bit different. Again, I think just even with the media access, we're able to see a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um but it's just been different. It's just an overall vibe, obviously, especially with the fan base and whatnot. When you have a new guy coming in and a guy who's a Bruin himself, there's just a lot of optimism, right? A lot of optimism, a lot of hope. I think that goes with any new coach. But um, those are probably some of the major differences that I'm seeing so far is just how candid uh, Deshaun Foster has been so far in his first year. There's two sides to this coin, James, as I see it. It's hard to coach your alma mater. It really is. It's a difficult yeah. thing. And maybe it's different now than it was 20 years ago. But I will say this. I, I was very intrigued by the hire. And it goes mm -hmm. back to when I was at UCLA. And I had a job on campus. And one of the young ladies that worked with me, a friend of mine, she'd gone to high school with Deshaun Foster. So, but mm -hmm. she wasn't into yeah. sports at all, you know. And so I think a couple of us were at the copy machine talking about football. <laughs> and she starts like, oh, Deshaun, Deshaun. I'm like, wait a minute. You're not into sports at all. It's like, oh, but Deshaun's not like that. Deshaun's kind of an all-around guy, you know. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. so it's a little bit of insight into his personality. Okay, can this guy run a program? And obviously, he was a very good student in high school, and obviously did mm -hmm. a lot of success in the NFL. The other opportunity that I had to just kind of meet him briefly was when I first started doing play-by-play. -play, 
one of the players I covered was his younger sister had played uh, played for oh. UC Riverside when I was doing play by play there. And he, you know, I think at that point he was either still in the NFL or just transitioning out of the NFL. This is back mm-hmm. 08, 09, back in those days. But what I found interesting was she would always talk about how supportive he was to her. And then he did, I think at the end of the year, they had a good year. And at the end of the year, he did show up kind of at the end of the year, whatever bank right. celebration they had to support his sister. So, you know, it's there. But when you talk to people who have been involved with the with the university and the program, what I hear a lot of with him is he's one of us. He mm-hmm. understands the little things. And there's a funny little thing on, on LinkedIn that UCLA is the third most popular, you know, fake school that people like to attach themselves to. <laughs> I think it's like Harvard, Yale, and UCLA, you know, and as you know, you've been around campus, so you get it. They're the little things, right? You can talk right. about, well, I guess it's, it's fat, it's fat sales now, but you know, you can talk yeah. about Dee yeah. Reese and Buck Fitties and Shakey's mm-hmm. and all that stuff when back when Deshaun was here. But as far as the on the field stuff, are there major, are, are there major differences or is the offense going to kind of be run similarly? We'll get to Coach Bienemy in a little bit. Sure. But what what are the what are the couple of observations, James, that have jumped out at you? Yeah, I I think just so far, I mean, again, we're we're it's you know much like it was with Chip. We're not seeing too much, right? I mean, they're only going to show you so much. I think one again, you want to talk about big changes. One of the biggest changes had just been we're able to go. Well, he had one. He canceled. He he had announced two. There, I don't know if there's miscommunication, whatever it was. But we had at least one open practice during training camp. That was like a big no-no with Chip. Like that would have never, that never would have been approved. So just even during that, you know, again, it's a lot of the same talent. A lot of the same guys came back, obviously knowing Deshaun and, and being familiar with him. But mm-hmm. I'm I'm just seeing, you know, just even the guys that they brought in. I mean, it's not like I remember the first like two years of Chip Kelly. It was like they had two or three, you know, starting receivers. And only they only threw it to Kyle Phillips. Like Chase Coda was just kind of there, but he wasn't, you know. Yeah. I was like, well, I was like, when are we ever gonna get when are we ever gonna see Chase Coda get the ball? So now it's like, you know, they got five or six guys and all of them could play receiver and, and all of them might play. And right, all of them might end up scoring at least a touchdown. I would imagine there's just so many guys that Ethan Garbers will have the opportunity to throw the ball to. Um I would I I mean, I would have to imagine that the run game is gonna be a, a huge part obviously with Deshaun Foster having been the running backs coach the last five years him being a running back and himself at UCLA as we mentioned but then also I and mean, we'll talk more about Eric Bieniemy here in a minute but even with him being the offensive coordinator and being a running back I don't think uh the, the running game is, is going to fall short by any means obviously with T.J. Harden coming back um in terms of of, of what it's been called uh, you know they, they've said it's going to be more of a west coast offense I mean I would imagine if Chip Kelly's not there, I mean, it doesn't matter who else you would have brought in. It was going to be different from what Chip Kelly does, just because Chip Kelly's kind of in his own world when it comes to offense and the way he sees things. But um, I think they're taking more of a can- um, a West Coast offense approach. And if you're looking for what that may look like, you obviously the Kansas City Chiefs, where Eric Bieniemy had been uh, in previous years, and maybe even a more better example, because I know there were some questions on if he was the one really calling the offensive plays there at Kansas city, but he was with the Washington commanders as the offensive coordinator there. So maybe there's some insight there on what it can be, but again, he's working with the talent that's available to him. He's back at the college level. So maybe even that's shaken up a little bit from what we've seen from him in the NFL. I mean, listen, Andy Reid sings his praises. And I mean, Mm -hmm. even in college, when he played, he played for a guy, you know, he played for a couple of guys who were really innovative you know, McCartney, mm-hmm. and I think Barnett was the coordinator there. And yeah. I've gotten a chance to work with, with Coach Barnett on, on, the, on the radio side a little bit. Um, but you did mention Ethan Garbers. And mm-hmm. it's almost like it's come full circle. You know, they seem to go everywhere to try to find a quarterback. And here he <laughs> yeah. is, a guy right out of your own, you know, your, your own backyard. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the look been with him, James? How do you feel watching him? Is he, a, you know, part of it, obviously, is the ability and then right. that, that's continued on a lot of things. Like we talked about the running game, the passing game, the offensive line. Mm-hmm. But as far as that team, can he lead this team? I think he could definitely lead the team. And I think even Deshaun Foster kind of said so. Obviously, he's been uh, – Foster has been there throughout the whole time Garbers was there. So he has an understanding of what of what he was when he walked in the door to where he is now. Um, he's definitely a guy who's kind of coming to his own, right? And uh, there was no – 
no shortage of adversity if you just look at what last season was. And I think that's just kind of the thing. Like, he he's more or less been announced as QB1. I don't think you're going to get some fancy graphic or ESPN is going to make a, a big tweet about it like they have with some of these other schools. But um, even Garbers is quarterback one. And it would – I just wonder what the the – the thought would be on him if he had all of last season, right? If he wasn't juggling it between Colin Schley and Dante Moore, and it was this rotation of guys, and no one ended up looking good coming out of that situation. I think, if anything, um, the fact that Garbers ended the season the way that he did there against Boise State when he wasn't even going to play in that L.A. Bowl game at SoFi, yeah. um, messes around, comes out there in relief, um, and, and lights a fire under UCLA and gets them the win over Boise State. So... I think there's a little bit of confidence there. I think that did well for his confidence. Um, he's obviously, you know, just talking about what it's been like to work with Eric Bieniemy in that offense. Again, I think it helps that they have the chemistry already with the guys on the field, but they're all learning a new offense, right? And I think that's the biggest thing, and that was probably the biggest challenge for him is you're in line to almost kind of be the starter, but you're going to have to know and understand what this playbook's going to be and what Eric Bieniemy is asking for you. And Eric Bieniemy is, was kind of asking a lot and had been very vocal. And I think he expects the same out of his quarterback, Nathan Garbers. I think the one thing that's going to be interesting and that I'm going to keep an eye on is what is that communication going to look like? Is Garbers going to look lost out there? They're going to have the the headset or the walkie talkie in the, in the helmets this year. So, Maybe does that work to his advantage? We'll have to see. But I think Ethan Garbers has all this stuff. Now, I don't know if he'll be this elite quarterback. I mean, if you just look at the other guys that are that are in this conference, Dylan Gabriel, um, Will Howard, say what you want about him. But there's plenty of guys in this conference. So, I mean, I think it would do wonders for UCLA if, if, if he was kind of ranked or, or, or somehow finishes in, in that group of the, the upper tier. I think that would be ideal for UCLA. But at the moment, he's probably middle of the pack just because there's still a lot to be proven from a guy like Ethan Garbers. But I think he has all the right stuff. He's comfortable. He's been there for a number of years now. I think he's itching to get out there. I mean, he's waited his turn for so long. I think he spent, if I'm not mistaken, it was two years behind Dorian Thompson Robinson. And now, again, everyone thought last year was going to kind of be the year for him. But Dante Moore had to get his time in. Consciously comes in. They have to give him his time. However, that played out for Chip Kelly. But um, there's no doubt about it. Ethan Garbers is QB one going into this, and uh, they got a lot of other guys in that quarterback room. But I think there, there's no doubt about it that Ethan Garbers is the guy, and uh, they'll go as far as as he takes them, at least on offense. Hey, last time the Bruins won the Rose Bowl, it was Matt Stevens. So if mm -hmm. Ethan Garber can be a little Matt Stevens, <laughs> um, now right. we've talked about it a little bit. I'm going to ask you directly now. You're a little too sure. young, probably, to remember the the uh, sure. the uh, the height of NFL prime time on ESPN with Chris Berman. And I, one of I the, know, yeah, oh, you know, but one of the that, yeah. best nicknames was Eric sleeping with the enemy when he was when he was running around the the Bishop Amat kid. Right, um, kid. Right. I mean, he's he's you know full on NFL. <laughs> he was NFL coordinator for for a decade now. Mm -hmm. um, Dealing with Coach Bieniemy, I mean, he's uh, – I've been impressed by what I've seen in terms yeah. of how he's communicated, and obviously the NFL mm -hmm. has helped him in that sense. My my sure. concern would be if they do well, he's going to get poached. That would be my concern. And how's how's it been like for you to deal with Coach Bieniemy? So to, your, to, to what you said there about him being poached, you know, I, I'm kind of – I'm not – in a sense, I'm kind of not expecting him to be there for more than – than a year or two and I don't know if that means they do well yeah. and he he gets a head coaching job uh yeah. you know in college or maybe that happens again for him in the NFL look I put it this way and I, I'm I whatever I, Deion, I don't think Deion Sanders is going to be at Colorado beyond this year well and that and that's I, exactly the formula yeah they might be they they could be looking at Eric Bannemi who's an alum of Colorado and say right hey why not? You know what I mean? So, and they're going to want to bring a high profile guy in there as well. Someone who, you know, because whoever is going to have to go in behind Dion is, you know, I mean, Eric Bieniemy fits in nicely, but it, in terms of how he's been, we haven't had too many interactions with him. Um, during the, during the spring, we had, so, there were some open practices where it's open to the public and you're able to look over the parking structure there. You can hear Eric Bieniemy from no matter where you're at on, on the field in the parking lot, very vocal demands a lot of his guys and obviously he kind of has this reputation um, whether it was from players or whatever the case may have been on why he didn't get these head coaching opportunities or, or he was getting the interviews but he wasn't getting the jobs 
um, you know, something where he's rough around the edges. He was hard on the player. The player isn't like whatever the case was. I don't see it. Maybe I don't know. Maybe 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 we'll see it at some point. But I mean, he's a vocal guy. You know, he he has a cuss word in there once or twice if, if things aren't going the way he wants. And obviously, you know, they're learning the offense for the first time. So there was some growing pains early on for everybody. Um, not as much of the yelling now. And I think we've even heard it with a guy like TJ Harden where, yeah. you know, they're saying he's getting comfortable and he's learning and he's able to be confident and move faster out there on the field. So I think the guys are getting it. And so, you know, they know Eric Bieniem is hard on them. Garber said, Hey, that's just part of it. I want to be coached by an NFL guy. My, my, my dream yeah. is to go to the NFL. So <clears throat> it, I mean, who better than Eric Bieniem to tell me? And if Eric Bieniem tell me something, I'm going to listen. Now, when we, when he's talked to the media, I mean, I don't claim to be a fan of UCLA or any or any football team, but I mean, he won he he won me over that day. I mean, he 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 came off as such a gentleman, and I think there's also the understanding for him. I mean, I, I I'd be lying if I said I heard a bunch of his press conferences or media availability when he was in the NFL. Yeah. Um, and obviously the approach is different, but he knows he's dealing with young men, young men who are going to go on to ideally do great things either on it both on and off the field. So he has that approach and he has that understanding. And I don't think he's just taking it as, Hey, I'm only going to be here for a year. So whatever no, happens, no. happens. I mean, he, he, he's so, an LA guy. We talked about Bishop. Yeah. He's an LA guy, but mm-hmm. here, here's what I think the misunderstanding is about. And I don't know. I never met the man. Sure. Right? sure. I'm guessing if you're in a room with Andy Reid, there are a lot of people in there who know a lot about offense. Okay. Mm-hmm. You cannot be a shrinking violet, you know, and it's yeah. the way that he, we saw it. We saw it in the Super you know, the whole big thing with, with Travis Kelsey and him going back and forth. You know, and you sure. did, I mean, even at like a high school, you've been down on the sideline. It gets loud. There's a hundred oh, yeah. things going on. Nobody right. can hear anybody, you know, and people mm-hmm. don't understand. I mean, you know, I'll be trying to make a phone call in from the arena, you know, and it's, you can't hear a thing. And <laughs> right. so I am right. guessing that Andy Reid is totally cool with that. And so he's mm-hmm. telling his guys, hey, you, you know, if you guys see something, you got to let me know what's going on. And that mm-hmm. maybe isn't always done in the most delicate manner. Sure. So then now you move to a, a different type. You're just used to that. You know, it's like what kind yeah. of family you grow up in, right? You grow up in a family mm-hmm. where everybody kind of hides what they think, or do you grow up in a family <laughs> like I did where everybody, nobody's afraid to tell you what they think. Right. You know? <laughs> and, and I think that's a little bit might work against Coach Bianami, but I think the results. Sure. We've seen the results, and he's been in the you know he's been in the game a long time. And like we were mm-hmm. talking about, he's worked for a lot of respected people, and I'm excited to see what he can bring to Westwood. Um, all right, I have two more things for you. Uh, sure. New de- defensive coordinator. The Bruins had a great defense last year, which was mm-hmm. why I think a lot of the fans were so disappointed in terms of what they weren't able to accomplish. Um, what new guy in town? And, you know, he's stripped away a couple of the top elements from last year's defense. Mm-hmm. How does the defense look? What's your understanding? What are people talking about with the Bruins defense? Yeah, so the defense is going to be interesting this year. Again, you lose De'Anton Lynn to USC, and I know that's kind of a heartbreaker for a lot of UCLA fans. But, you know, I've kind of gone back and forth with this, and I hear the national radio kind of perspective of, Oh, well, they lost De'Anton Lynn. Oh, my God. And I'm like, he was only there for a year, right. if that. I mean, it was literally probably only a couple months. Um, and he had Liatu Latu and the Murphy Twins. Now, I mean, I'm going to give him his credit because Liatu Latu and the Murphy Twins were there the season before. And, you know, yes. they were, you know, they, they were doing quality stuff, but they weren't doing stuff to the magnitude they were this past season. So how much of that was, was those guys, their development going into their final, what was their final year at UCLA? How much of that was D'Anton Lynn? I mean, D'Anton Lynn, the only reason why sometimes I kind of hesitate to give all or most of the credit to to D'Anton Lynn is he had never really even been a defensive coordinator. Yeah. He'd only been a position coach. Now, I don't want to discredit him too much. I mean, he obviously did some great things and helped turn that defense around because the defense had always been the sore spot uh, covering UCLA. And again, like you mentioned, I think that's why there was a little sense of, of disappointment of, wow, now the defense is finally doing good, but we can't figure out our quarterback situation. If you have Ethan Garber from the jump, maybe there's some consistency there and you're looking at a whole different season for UCLA. But, you know, so you lose the Achi Lachi, you, you lose the Murphy Twins, you lose Carl Jones, you lose a whole lot of production there with that edge rush. So it's a matter of how are they going to try and put that together? How are they going to try and make that work? 
And I think that's the questions they're still trying to figure out themselves, right? So they had plenty of time. I mean, by the time you de they're declaring for the draft, I mean, you kind of know what you have and what you don't have. So they got some guys. They got this guy, J Jacob Busick uh, from Navy. He uh, more or less kind of followed Ken Neomontololo there. Obviously, mm -hmm. Ken is now the head coach at San Jose State. Um, but I think Jacob had some experience. I think he started, uh, if you look at the last three years for him, he started those first two, I think, you know, all 14 games, 12 or 14 games there has tons of experience last year, I think was dealing with an injury and was held to like four games. Um, so the last year wasn't very impressive just because the number, if you're just looking at the numbers, but I think he could be a quality guy for them. I think they, they have another guy that they got as a transfer from Notre Dame, which seems like forever ago, because I don't even, I count him as a UCLA guy, not as a Notre Dame transfer, but Devin Apu is another guy. Um, or Devin Apayu, I believe, is is the pronunciation there. But uh, mm -hmm. he has an opportunity to do some things. He he did play. He's probably the only guy on the defensive line that is going to be serving as an edge rusher that has played in a UCLA uniform, that has any sort of experience in the blue and gold there. So uh, there's going to be some expectations on those guys. And I think the expectation is just going to be too much, regardless of who you are, to match what it was last year. Um, but they've been trying some different things. Defensive coordinator Akaika Molloy obviously was the defensive line coach last year, so knew what he had and knew the talent that was going to be behind Latu and, and, and whatnot. But um, they've been trying some different things. They've had linebacker Olifemi Oladejo kind of put his hand down and, yeah. and kind of serve as, as an edge rusher there. He had, obviously has the body for it. So um, I think even if he goes to explore the next level, maybe that's a, a place where he could fit. So um, they're trying him out. I think and that was even going as early in the spring. Now, even more recently, during training camp, we've seen Kane Madrano, a guy who's moved yeah. around a few different positions during his time at UCLA um, and has kind of settled in at linebacker. He's been rushing the ball, uh, rushing towards the quarterback here a little bit uh, during training camp. So they're going to try a number of different guys. They have a few other guys there that they brought in. Uh, Collins, Collins Acupong uh, is another guy that they have in. Sharif Say is another guy they got from Florida A&M. So they have some different guys, and it's just a matter of still getting them acclimated, getting them going. They're going to serve as great depth. Some of them, like like Collins, is is a guy who's only a, a true sophomore, I think. So he might be a project for even a longer-term uh, pass rush option for them. But they have some guys. I think it's just going to be a matter of how it looks. And, I, again, they're still trying to figure that out. But I think if they can put a formula together that works for them, I think they can at least – uh, produce a quality pass rush. I don't think it's ever going to be elite like it was last. Getting back to De'Anton Lynn, I, I have you know, over the years when I talk to coaches, one of the things that, I think I think this is what Coach Lynn did last year is you know sometimes when you have talent like that, you just got to mm -hmm. get it's hard. You got to get out of the way. You know, yeah. I remember talking to a basketball coach who had an all conference point guard. He's telling me, you know, we butted heads for so, and then I realized. Well, that point guard is just like who I was when I played. Yeah. So let me take a step <laughs> yeah. back and sure enough, mm -hmm. and, you know, they went to two tournaments in a row. Um, mm -hmm. And then as far as, you know, the Gar Garber's question apparently is, is the big one. And I always think of the movie Miracle. When I look at a guy, you know, because you look at, you know, obviously Dante Moore, an incredible talent last year. Mm -hmm. You know, Schnee had his, had his positives. But sometimes it's not about the best guy. It's about the right guy. Can you find right. the right guy that has the temperament? They, like, and, and I think what you're what you were talking about in terms of his communication with enemy leads me to believe. Okay, I mean, listen, we haven't played a game yet, so you don't want to go crazy. Yeah. But that's kind of what you need is, hey, I want this guy to, to ride me. I want this guy right. to coach, you know, to coach me mm -hmm. tough, to be tough with me when I'm coaching. All right, James H. Williams, thank you again. Last thing for you, sure. Your, if this is going to be your first year covering a Big Ten program. Has it sunk wow. in yet? The Bruins are in the Big Ten. I'll never forget. I got, I didn't, I was, I don't know what I was doing the day it happened. Mm -hmm. My brother sent me a message on Twitter. He goes, Hey, check this out that USC and UCLA, because, <laughs> you know, he's in the East Coast, he's three hours ahead of time. Right, so I'm like looking right. for my phone at 6 45, and it's like, Yeah, the Bruins and the Trojans are going to the Big Ten. And obviously the Ducks and the Huskies have since joined them. What's right. your, we, we, we did actually a whole podcast on it a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Now that it's here, how you feeling? What's going on? First of all, I look back at that podcast, the, the one that we did the yeah. first go round. And I was like, I felt like one, I was so much still in the weeds on what college football was beyond Westwood. But now looking back at it, I was like, oh, my God, 
we were talking about realignment then and I didn't even realize it. Um, like I didn't, you know, it, it just seemed like a fantasy. It was almost like playing fantasy football all the time. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. but three, what is it, three years now, fast forward and it's like, oh. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's interesting. Here's so here's the thing. Um, you're not. Do, do, do you travel? Of, you don't, you don't travel, right? With the, do you I travel? don't travel. Okay. I don't travel as much. Okay. Um, as much as I would like to, probably. Um, I'll put it that way. But um, I would say it's probably not a good. It's probably good. I'm not traveling as much because have you seen the number? I mean, I'm sure it's been out. There. Have you seen what the number is as far as travel miles for UCLA? I think it's number one, right? They're they're gonna travel the most. They're is that what it they're is? number. They're like number one, number two. I think how. There's another former Pac-12 team that might edge them out a little bit, but regardless, UCLA is going to travel nearly what would a, a, be the equivalent of a trip around Earth. Oh wow! And that sounds crazy, but when you think about it, they're going this way to Hawaii, they're going this way to yeah. Nebraska, Penn, you know, so it adds up. Um, so they have that going for them. It's a tough schedule, tough mileage. So a lot of that. They're just kind of playing off like, hey, we're not there yet. We're just, you know, we're just trying to get through training camp, yada, yada. Um, it might hit them like a ton of bricks at some point, especially, you know, you're going to play Hawaii in week one. You're going to you're going to come back home. You're going to play Indiana. And that will be kind of the first real like, oh, we're in the Big Ten. We're playing Indiana in a regular season conference game. OK, that's different. Um, but then you have a tough three game stretch after that, including non-conference LSU. Traveling yeah. to Baton Rouge. Then you have Oregon, I believe. That one's at home. And then you are traveling to Penn State, Penn State. where you're gonna you're gonna get your your real Big Ten welcome, right? Because obviously Oregon is a team you're familiar with from the Pac 12, but that Penn State game is is going to be, you know, they're known for their crazy crowd. Obviously, they're a quality opponent. They're usually in the mix as one of those top three schools. Uh, in previous years when it came to who's sitting at the top of the Big Ten. So I think it's going to be interesting. Right now, you're not seeing a whole lot other than the media day stuff and, and the different yeah. photos where the, the you got the Big Ten patch on the jerseys. We talked yeah. to Deshaun Foster, and he has a new background behind him that with the UCLA logo, but also the Big Ten logo. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. seeing some of that stuff, but you're not seeing much else. Uh, but it's when these guys are going to have to start doing back-to-back -back trips. I know they have a back, they have back-to-back -back road games. There's a bye week in there. How are they? What are they doing during that bye week? Those are the questions that still have to be answered. And maybe they don't entirely know all the answers to them. Maybe that's going to come along as they kind of take their lumps along the way. Um, so it's going to be interesting. But they do need to win these first two games, or it's yep. it's going to be a very it's going to be a very rough season. <laughs> Have you do you have any insight in terms of how they're going to travel? Has anybody told you anything about that or no? Every time I've tried to ask, they don't they don't bend on it too much. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 that's gonna... what I, I mean, that's what I they want to keep that stuff. I yeah. get it. I'm just curious, they're... you know, a manager says something, you know, like in terms, oh man, right. we gotta, you know, you know. I mean, you wouldn't I wouldn't rule out the possibility. And and here's the thing, we don't they would normally travel on Friday morning or whatever right. to go to where, wherever game. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they do a light practice on Thursday and then they're out of their Thursday evening somehow. I'm, or guess, I'm even guessing like, if they're flying east, like if they go play Rutgers in Penn State, yeah. I would guess they right. take the red the red eye on Thursday. But you know, that's just like mm -hmm. and I'm you know, because I we do travel for basketball, it's always intriguing yeah. to see how that gets done. Mm -hmm. Um well, I'm interested. Well, 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 I'm, Real yeah. quick for you. So when you're doing that traveling, how do you feel coming back after a trip? I mean, I don't play. That's the whole thing. Well, that's is, true. I, I guess that's true. Is, but is, is, it is. I mean, like people say, oh, it's a great. And it kind of is. But it's like yeah. I can arrange my work schedule to if I'm taking, mm -hmm. you know, this like like these kids, they take the six o'clock flight back and they're in class at 830. Whereas yeah. I can I can yeah. put off my meetings till 11. I can right. go home, right. take a nap, make some breakfast. And then my first phone calls, at, you know, mm -hmm. at 11 a.m., you know, right. Um, but yeah, it's 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 tough. Like just with the Big West stuff, obviously it's more yeah. of a bus league. But we do the you know we do the Hawaii trip. Um, mm -hmm. CSUN basketball is doing an East Coast trip this year, and it's you know it it can be tough. It can be tough how they do yeah. it. Now, um, I had a, a good friend who played college football. He said you know football travel is very different because you're only mm -hmm. playing one day in the week. You're yeah. pushing everything towards that one day. And so what right. I'd be more interested in the travel stuff when baseball and soccer and, oh, uh, yeah. foot, and basketball, basketball roll mm -hmm. around. But before I let you go, in terms sure. of the Big Ten, I I believe mm -hmm. that the, these Pac-12, the former Pac-12 schools, 
are going to surprise a little bit because I think yeah. people don't realize how top to bottom these good, these West Coast conferences mm -hmm. are, how tough some of these road trips are, even though they're not very far. I mean, you sure. want to go to Oregon State, you want to go to Wazoo and play a wacky game. I believe, mm -hmm. and it may take a couple of years, but a lot of these conferences they, that pride themselves, they're really top heavy, you know? Yeah. I mean, even look at the Big Ten. After the top three teams, you know, sure. I, 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 you know, I wouldn't like Oregon <laughs> supposedly going to be really, really good this year, but Washington, Oregon, those are going to be rough trips. LA mm -hmm. is a fairly easy trip, no matter where you're coming from. You right. want to go to Eugene, you've been to, you know, you've been to Seattle, you know how that all works. Mm -hmm. It's, right. it, it can be tough. I'm curious what your insight is from people you've talked to. I know you talked to Josh mm -hmm. a lot about in terms of the right. level of competition. How do you think year one, the West Coast Big Ten schools do? Yeah. So, uh, it might be different for Oregon and USC just because of what they're able to do in recruiting and who they've been able to bring in. But I like one of the things I have to do one day is I have to sit down and map out who are these new offensive line targets that UCLA is going to be going after compared to what it has been. Yeah. What is the size on these guys compared to what it had been, right? Obviously, California is not known for its offensive linemen. So Obviously, there's going to have to be more of a commitment to traveling elsewhere to do the recruiting to bring these offensive linemen in. So maybe that might serve as one of the, the bigger downfalls for UCLA this year. Obviously, just it's a question on what the offensive line is going to look like just because they're bringing in some guys to fill in some holes there. But um, how, the, how those guys stack up remains to be seen for UCLA when it comes to the Big Ten. And that's something that I'll be keeping an eye out for. But I think overall, in general, when you include Washington, you include Oregon, you include USC, I think they'll do fairly well. And again, I, I would imagine much like you said, for as much as we talk about them traveling elsewhere, it's when you get these other teams that are going to have to take the trip this way and how they fare, how maybe they take it for granted. Maybe they think it's no big deal. Uh, and maybe that one of those teams gets caught slipping. I mean, say what you want about Washington. They thinned it out a little bit just because of the talent they lost going to the NFL and the yeah. coaching change. But you got a quality guy like Jeff Fish in there. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes around, messes around, and, and, and beats a team or two that maybe he wasn't supposed to in year one at home. But even for UCLA, the thing I kind of enjoy about the Big Ten schedule and just the thought of it is, like you said, it's it's so top-heavy with, with the Ohio State, the Michigan, the Penn State. Everything after that is should make for a close game. Like, there's not – other than Hawaii, I, I wouldn't count every game as a automatic win. Right. It can go either way. Yeah. It, it, it could be down to one or two mistakes between Nebraska and, and UCLA, Nebraska and Rutgers, because Rutgers is kind of on the come up a little bit this year. Everyone is so good. You can't count out anybody in this conference. Um, I don't know. It should be exciting. I mean, again, I, you know, remains to be seen, but I would say UCLA is probably going to be a step behind here early on in terms of what the other big team, what the other Pac-12 to Big Ten teams are, especially with the expectation of an Oregon, for example. But um, overall, I think they'll be competitive and and you know cause some chaos regardless of what happens. All right, James. Always appreciate the time. I know you're a busy man. Again, check out the what's the name of the podcast on Believe. The Believe in UCLA Football Pod. All right. Believe in UCLA Football with James H. Williams and, and Josh Woods. You can read them in the Southern California News Group. An old friend from the old high school football days. And yes. hey, I, you, you know, I always smile when I see kind of yeah. every new thing you're doing. And I'm excited about the next <laughs> step you're talking about. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and don't get me wrong. I'll still be out at some high school games. I'll see you along the way here. Uh, I know some Ramona has some games and they're looking to defend that title. All right, man. I appreciate it, James. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, my man.